Coming up on DTNS, Apple reverses course on abusive imagery, good news in the fight against misinformation, and the next big blockchain hit involves a grim shout and divine robes. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 3rd, 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Draw on the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And the show's producer, Roger Shang. Uh, we were just talking about flying cars, becoming robots, a lot about Scooby-Doo. If you'd like that wider conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That's where you can join top patrons like Andrew Bradley, Dale McCahey, and Scott Hepburn. We're also uh, joined by Nicole Lee. Oh, that's right. Nicole Lee, senior editor from Engadget. Welcome to the show. Hello. Happy to be here. Indeed, it's good to have you back. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The U.S. National Labor Relations Board office based in Oakland, California, is investigating two charges against Apple filed by employees. Ashley jo uh, Jovic, a senior engineering program manager at Apple, told Reuters that she filed an August 26th charge over harassment by a manager, reduction of responsibilities, and increases in unfavorable work, among other complaints. Cher Scarlett, an Apple software engineer, filed her complaint on September 1st and said that the company repeatedly stopped discussions of pay among employees. Scarlett also said that Apple, quote, engaged in coercive and suppressive activity that has enabled abuse and harassment of organizers of protected concerted activity. Bloomberg sources say Beijing's municipal government proposed acquiring a stake in the ride-hailing giant Didi Global using a consortium of state-run firms. This proposal would see the stake granting the group veto power and a board seat, something we've seen them do with other companies. But we don't know how big of a stake the city is wanting or if this proposal has been approved by any senior government officials. WhatsApp is rolling out its cross-platform chat history transfer feature that was first announced at Samsung's Unpacked event earlier this month. The tool allows chat history, voice memos, photos, and videos to be transferred between Android and iOS devices. Although the feature is currently only available on Samsung phones running Android 10 and above, WhatsApp says it will come to more Android devices soon. El Salvador is set to become the first country in the world to recognize Bitcoin as legal tender. That's coming up September 7th. But polls suggest Salvadorans are not prepared, and the World Bank has warned against the move. Under the country's new Bitcoin law, businesses would have to accept either Bitcoin or the U.S. dollar as payment. El Salvador's government is offering $30 in free Bitcoin to encourage citizens to use the national wallet by using an app. Apple published a job posting for an RISCV high performance programmer. RISCV is an open source instruction set architecture that doesn't require licensing fees like ARM. The post indicates that Apple is already working on RISV implementations with the programmer working on machine learning, computational vision, and natural language processing. All right, let's talk about that big about face. Apple announced it will delay implementing the recently announced child protection features. Uh, that is all of them. So the message scanning for uh, 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 sexually explicit imagery, the the scanning of any uploads against a hash table of things you want to send uh, to iCloud that are photos, as well as the, the less controversial thing where they would just add some information to Siri. Apple posted a statement that said, Previously, we announced plans for features intended to help protect children from predators who use communication tools to recruit and exploit them and to help limit the spread of child sexual abuse material, or CSAM. Based on feedback from customers, advocacy groups, researchers, and others, we have decided to take additional time over the coming months to collect input and make improvements before releasing these critically important child safety features. So this applies, like I said, to the matching of photos headed to iCloud against a hash table of known CSAM images. It applies to Apple Messages algorithm to scan for sexually explicit images. And it applies to updated information available in Siri and Search. Uh, Nicole, I'm, I'm not sure where you fell on the myriad opinions uh, about this. What do, what do you think of it and what do you think about the delay? I think the way Apple has gone about this, um, I understand what they're saying in the, in the sense of like the matching is on device only. It's not matching something to the cloud as far as I can tell anyway. Uh, but even that 
uh, some people have said the uh, privacy advocates have said that even that as a possibility for expansion, possibility for abuse, um, the possibility that might lead to you know privacy privacy concerns, and I kind of see everything from both sides. I I do think there is always a possibility that it could be exploited in some sense. I don't really know what Apple plans to do or to um, remedy that per se. I mean, it's always a good idea to at least talk to some advocates on both sides to, to see what they think should be the fix for this, if any. Yeah, that was kind of my question too is, okay, so Apple says we talked to some security experts and we felt like we you know, had something in the bag here. This is a good thing. This is, you know, this is what, what Apple's saying, and uh, and then a lot of uh, security and privacy experts ca came out and said, not necessarily. And then you've got a lot of fud that you know is is happening amongst people saying, well, what's ha happening with my phone? And you know, could this be something? Yeah, where it would be some sort of a false positive, and there's all sorts of questions. So for Apple to say, okay, we're going to take a step back and figure some things out, but we still really believe in this. My question is, okay, well, what changes then? What yeah. what changes so that yeah. people feel good about this going forward? I, I think that's a really important question because this is something worth doing. Uh, I, I, w I was on Bart Bouchot's Let's Talk Apple uh, podcast, and, and we kind of went over this. And my feelings have changed wildly about this over time. At the current moment, I'm feeling like, these aren't perfect, but they're they're things that need to happen. Uh, and and there's pressure on Apple, and they're going to have to make it happen uh, because there's pressure not only from from nonprofits and and advocacy organizations, but from governments as well. So they're going to have to do something. What other companies have agreed to do is scan in the cloud. And I think what Apple's trying to do is we can do better, but where they messed up, wasn't just announcing all three at once, which was confusing. I think that was one thing they probably shouldn't have done. But they didn't go to the security community. They went to a yeah. few individual researchers, but they didn't go to the security community. And as we all know with security, the more eyes on something, the more secure it gets. If they had started where they are now and said, hey, community, let's reach out. Let's look at like, oh, could, could we make a tweak here? Could we make a tweak there? How do we like ensure that this system can't be hijacked to be used for something else? And the security community provided feedback and then they launched with that. I think everybody would have been behind it because nobody is against the goal of this system. And I don't right. think anybody's against Apple wanting to make a better version of this than other companies have implemented. It's just that they there's a bunch of people saying, hey, wait a minute, I think I found a weakness in what you did and you're just gonna go do it. Uh, so this is the right move for Apple. It's late, but it's the right move to say, all right, let's talk to everybody. Let's get all the minds in the room. Not not everybody in the world, but the people who are involved in this community, in the security community, and let's see if we can tighten it up even more. Insider sources say that Amazon plans to release Amazon branded TVs in the US as early as October, right around the corner. <laughs> These TV sets would feature Amazon voice services, range from 55 to 75 inches, and be built by third parties like TCL. This is similar to Amazon Basics TVs sold in India that run in the Fire OS. The company's also reportedly developing an in house design TV, although no word on when that one will be released. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, misleading information being passed around uh, along with these stories. Uh, I, I commend Engadget and CNET uh, for doing a better job, I think, than a lot of other folks uh, by saying this is an Amazon branded TV. This is not Amazon making a TV, at least not right. yet. Uh, uh, so, so this is fairly uncontroversial. Uh, Walmart and Best Buy already do this. You can go buy an Insignia TV in Best Buy. That's Best Buy's house brand. They don't make it. I think TCL makes that one too. TCL makes a lot of these things that they slap <laughs> a label on and sell it. So this is no different than what a lot of other retailers do and and what Amazon was already doing in India. It's not even the first time that, that they've done it. They're just bringing it to the US. Uh, I guess, Nicole, the, the question would be, all right, are they gonna try to get away with favoring this uh, uh, um, above other models in their search results and stuff like that? I mean, they already are pushing um, Fire uh, TV uh, stuff on their on their store anyway. Like, yeah, you want yeah. you want to buy like a Fire TV thing or an Amazon uh, branded tablet versus another tablet. I mean, they they already kind of you know surface it 
already. So, I mean, and plus there's like a billion other Amazon basic products that are already being like floated on the algorithm. But if you really wanted to buy like something else, you could just search for it and you can still buy it, I think. So, uh, I mean, it's like with anything Amazon. I think they will probably favor their own stuff in terms of the search ranking. Um, you just kind of have to be a smart consumer and hopefully read a lot of reviews and make your own educated, um, you know, picks and uh, purchases and uh, not just pick the first one that comes up on search. Well, and, you know, Amazon obviously under fire for supposedly juicing its own yeah, its own right. products, you know, already it, it's, if the company were to want to do that, it would have to be very careful at this point. Uh, yeah, you know, and 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 really sort of lay out. Well, here's how, why we're not doing this, even though you saw the Amazon TV at the top of your search result. I mean, it's somebody who, <clears throat> pardon me, is in kind of in the market for a new TV. You know, not tomorrow, whatever. But I'm kind of doing my research. A company like TCL, I'd be like, okay, got it. You know, it's you know, they make really nice stuff. If it was an Amazon TV, I'd be like. I don't know. I mean, does Amazon really know how to make TVs? Even though there are third-party TV manufacturers that the company is obviously working with. But I think for a lot of folks who are, uh, you know, they, they're they used to their Echo devices. Uh, Amazon makes, you know, a variety of hardware now that's very popular. This might be a pretty popular TV. Yeah, in some sense, that the more I think about it, the more I realize, like, this, this will be a, a, a decision of principle. Because if TCL is making these, I know they're not making all of them, but let's say TCL is making the one you want to buy and it's, you know, $50 cheaper to buy the Amazon Basics version than the actual TCL branded one. Well, then it becomes like, do I mind saving $50 and buying the Amazon branded one? Or I mean, I, or, I wouldn't. You know, if I, should if I, stand I knew on that my they were the same or? under the hood, I yeah. wouldn't at all. But yeah. Restofworld.org has a report on a Mozilla Foundation study that documented a social media disinformation campaign to undermine Kenya's judiciary as it reviewed constitutional reforms. And it wasn't all bots. Participants in the campaign uh, that were humans were paid between $10 and $15 a day to tweet hashtags, and some verified accounts were found participating in the campaign, which helped those hashtags to trend. More than 20,000 tweets from 3,742 accounts were posted between May and June. The Oxford Internet Group estimates more than $60 million a year is taken in by firms that promote messages using bots and other amplification strategies. So it's just another example of that. Rest of the world takes Twitter to task for maybe not doing as much uh, as they would have liked uh, to combat that. We also have an article on the Washington Post reporting that a forthcoming study from scientists at New York University and the Université Grenoble Alp in France found that from August 2020 to January 2021, news publishers known for misinformation got six times the amount of likes, shares, and interactions on Facebook, as did trustworthy news sources. Categorizations were created by nonprofits NewsGuard and Media Bias Fact Check, and it included uh, extreme sites on the left and the right. Facebook notes that engagement is not the same as views. That's their new line of saying, sure, a lot of people engaged with this, but few people see it. The study did not find that Facebook amplified misinformation because it did well with users, regardless of partisanship. Uh, so it wasn't they were trying to pick a side. They were amplifying it for everyone. Uh, non Nonpartisan amplification of misinformation. So we got more evidence of misinformation campaigns. I don't think that surprises anybody. More evidence that misinformation gets engagement. We've heard that song before. What do you do about it? That brings us to the final study in our story today. Justin Robert Young pointed this out to me this morning in a text message. A paper in the journal Science Advances called Scaling Up Fact-Checking Using the Wisdom of the Crowds hired 1,287 people in the U.S. on Amazon's Mechanical Turk to rate articles flagged for fact-checking by Facebook's algorithm. They wanted to compare them to the pros. What if we just hire a balanced group of people to do this versus people who are supposedly trained as fact checkers? The result was compared to the work of three professional fact checkers. The politically balanced group of lay people agreed with each individual fact checker as often as the fact checkers, the three fact checkers, agreed with each other. So basically, if you take the 1,287 people as a whole, they did just as good as everybody else. The idea being that a politically balanced group of people in a great enough number would do just as well as checking facts 
as the pros. So maybe you don't need to hire organizations that some people may or may not believe. Maybe you could set up a system or a panel or something like that. The paper said in its conclusion, we believe that in combination with other measures like detection algorithms, trained experts, and accuracy prompts, that crowdsourcing could be a valuable asset in combating the spread of misinformation on social media. Uh, so we're, we're back to the old wisdom of the crowds in this paper. Boy, it sucks to be a fact checker, I guess. <laughs> You're going to get replaced <laughs> by the Mechanical Turk crowd, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I mean it all, sucks to all, be a fact checker in a lot of ways, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, all kidding aside, I mean, not not to uh, d diminish anything that that actual actual <laughs> professional fact checkers are doing, but yeah, this is a it's it's an interesting way to look at. Okay, so there's a bunch of misinformation. Everyone knows that. You know, how do we combat this on the platforms where the misinformation is being spread the most? B big problem. And and it's certainly something that we talk about on this show all the time and a lot of people care about. <clears throat> but uh, but yeah, to be able to say if you get a good enough, uh, you know, focus group of people who don't necessarily all believe the same thing, they're just representing a small a small group of what a lot of uh, a larger group of people would think, probably, because that's what fo focus groups could do. And they're kind of coming up with the same result as fact checkers. That is a good thing, and that means that there might be more of this that we can do, and not necessarily have to use only certain organizations who, quote, you know, do this professionally. There are two things that come up to my mind. First is you really do have to have a good focus group, and I think that's probably the key to all of this. And the second thing I think, it has to be somewhat anonymous or anonymized in some way, because I feel like a lot of people, uh, they say things, they may, they, may not, I mean, they may not really believe them, but because they belong to a certain ideological group or they belong to a certain community or they belong to a certain whatever, they feel like they need to say things to align themselves with that group. So if, if, it, if, it's, a, if, it's, a, if it's anonymous enough, if it's... Um, really, you know, I guess you could say balanced enough that I can totally see this working in a larger scale. Yeah, the, the, you really should read the report uh, if, if you're listening and, and you're having questions about, well, what about gaming the system? You know, what a, yeah, yeah, what yeah. about uh, partisanship amongst the, the group that you pick uh, in the crowd? Because they address all that uh, with citations in the paper. Uh, they basically say probably all the partisans would be canceling each other out with their efforts uh, to, to bias mm -hmm. uh, the results. And they point out with a citation, mind you, most Americans don't care that much about politics. So they're unlikely to be overly motivated to distort their responses. You, you will be led to believe by TV news that that's not true, but uh, it's actually true. So it's, again, to your point, Nicole, it's, it's making sure you pick the right group and that your selection, right. it's the selection of the group where the bias could creep in. But if you select the right great group, this paper seems to say like it's achievable uh, mm -hmm. to not have that be a problem. Hey folks, uh, if you've got thoughts about this, you can talk about it with us and other members of the audience in our Discord. Uh, join it by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. A lot of outlets have stories on a blockchain-based project today called Loot, L-O-O-T, from the co-founder of Vine, Dom Hoffman. For another project that he was working around on around text-based adventures, Hoffman had already created a random item generator, and that would just return the names for weapons and armor and accessories and the kinds of things you'd want if you're doing a D&D or Zork-style game. So he had the idea of letting people mint or create their own NFTs using Ethereum contracts. If you don't understand that, it's like just letting people, you know, basically buy uh, or, or create NFTs of the items. No artwork, no game associated with the items. He just wanted to try and experiment. So he created a list of items he called a bag. In fact, he created 8,000 bags, and he released these for free on the Ethereum network to anyone willing to pay the gas for the transfer. So it was just a contract saying, you are now the owner of this bag. He called the project Loot, launched it last Friday, created 8,000 bags, like I said, and released 7,777 of them. 
an example bag would be one that included hard leather armor, a grim shout grave wand of skill plus one, a divine hood, a gold ring, and, and a few other items. As with many things on the internet these days, the bags took off. They went from costing nothing but the gas to $180 million in market cap. <laughs> now remember, Huffman didn't get money from these. He did keep a few hundred bags, so he has them, they're worth something, but he didn't generate any money directly from selling them. He mostly just wanted to see what people would do with them. And here's what some people are doing besides flipping them for a profit. Some folks created art around the lists. Some have used the smart contracts the bags were based on to separate the items and sell them individually. Owners of divine robes, there are 396 divine robes out there, set up a community and a storefront for robe purchases. There are also guilds for people who are owners of crowns or dragons or other divine items. So people are organizing themselves. Now, no game has been set up yet. And partly that's because the barrier to entry is high because the prices of these bags and even the items from them are in the thousands. And yeah, if you've got the crypto, you wouldn't have to spend thousands of dollars for that, but not everybody has the crypto. So Wednesday, Hoffman announced a new spin called Synthetic Loot. These are duplicates of the loot bags that anyone with an Ethereum wallet can claim for free. You get one bag and you can claim it. There's an endless amount of them. They are distinguishable from the original, so they're not going to undermine the existing market, but they could encourage more people to participate in the ecosystem. So if the folks who own the originals create a game, other people could play it with their synthetic loot. They wouldn't be playing the original version, but they could play a version of it. That means when someone does make a game, that could get more popular. And Hoffman doesn't even consider himself in charge of this. He told The Verge, I'm not leading the project. I'm providing guidance when wanted. So he doesn't conceive of it about being about money. He said at the end of the day, these are just items on a list. It's just what people do with it and how they ascribe value to it. And the value doesn't have to be a dollar amount. It can be many things. A lot of people are imagining loot as a template for a bottom-up Marvel Cinematic Universe. I saw this on The Verge. I saw it on TechCrunch. I saw it on Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure who the first person to come up with it is, but everybody's parroting it. So the idea would be you release a set of superhero names and powers, and then people would make illustrations and stories around their heroes that could lead to shared storylines and more. I think this is the next thing in using blockchains that will illuminate what it's good for and what it, you couldn't have imagined it would be used for. It'll be another thing for people to easily dismiss and go, well, it's just a list. Who's the idiot who would pay for that? But will continue to be popular. And, and I think it's worth paying attention to because a lot of people are using the word metaverse around it because it's got characters and items and, and things that are virtual. Um, kind of hard to wrap your head around it, but it certainly seems to be popular, doesn't it? Nicole, you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a few questions and they might sound stupid, but bear in mind, I'm just coming from it from like a kind of a lay person's perspective. Sure, on this. sure. So um, when you say it, comes, it becomes a bottom up MCU and these items are, they're worth money, right? Apparently they're these yeah. things are worth yeah. some of the money. So how can they create a bottom up MCU? Like with the, like to do, 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 does the person who owns whatever, item do they own the 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 creation like how like how is that then shared with the world or something well that that That's seems not to be entirely sure about so so that seems to be the attraction is okay. you don't have a disney in charge of it so you don't oh. have a disney that has to get people behind it you create you create the superhero universe and let's say it gets popular like loot then suddenly people are people who own the superhero you know, can talk about it with other people. And then the stories arise from there, but there isn't an owner of it. And so the universe is is fuller and richer because of that is what I've seen it's people say. kind of a say. mix of open source, but not open source. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 kind of, it's a little confusing. <laughs> I also, I, you know, the, the whole idea of the this all being maybe around, sure, like some sort of a universe with characters and everything, but a game, a game yeah. that people are getting in exist. on, you know, you know, in an early stage. But yeah. then you've, you've, you sort of go, OK, well, at some point, maybe somebody will make a good game or, you know, there'll be a collaborative effort, whatever. Then you have the synthetic loot folks who can also participate in the game. But then how are they going to be different from the folks who have the, you know, the, the you know, 
ground zero type loot. Uh, is it just sort of something where it's like, I don't know, somebody's got a crown when you're playing the game with them at some point later and you're like, oh, they're like a cool person who like got this before right. me. It's, it's hard to know. Yeah, so, so a couple of things I think I suspect are going on. One is NFTs first and now this show that the impulse for ownership is a lot stronger than we think when we're talking about it in general. The impulse for ownership is really strong. And so owning a virtual item is very compelling to people. Even Some people are just doing this for, for speculation, but some people want to own that divine robe, right? And so sure. that's what makes that popular. And then once that gets popular, if the people who have it start playing a game around it, then some other people are like, well, I'd like to play that game, but I can't afford to buy the stuff. Oh, I can get the synthetic loot and play it with my friends. So it's, it's the popular, it, it's the comp the compulsion for ownership that makes the items popular, which then makes yeah. the game popular, which then makes other people want to play it, which makes the synthetic loot useful. It's kind of it's kind of the the flip the the flip process instead of like instead of a game that already exists and you buying things that that buy items of that yeah. game, it's it's the item itself that creates the game. Right. <laughs> Or maybe we're wrong. Maybe a game is not where this is going. Maybe this is going somewhere know. entirely different. Uh, it's yeah. kind of hard to tell right now. But I do think this, I don't think loot will be around necessarily. It might be in 20 years. That's not what I, I predict. But this will be a mile marker in something. They'll be like, loot sparked the thing that became X. It, it just right. has that flavor to it, to me. Well, whether or not uh, you uh, participate in crypto <laughs> and, and want to be part of the loot community, you also might be an avid hiker. And if you are, the Amateur Traveler has an app for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. A great app for you if you're traveling or even if you're staying home in 2021 is the All Trails app or the All Trails website, alltrails.com. It's great for finding that local hike that you haven't explored yet that's going to be a good match for what you're capable of doing. And it's also good for when you're traveling and you're looking for that perfect hike too. So we've used it this year around home and we've also used it in Great Smoky Mountain National Park and in the Shenandoah Parkway to try and figure out which of the many, many hikes we would be interested in doing. So check it out, get out of the house, alltrails.com. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Mm, nice, get out there. My only problem with hiking is a lot of times around here, there's too many people. <laughs> It's like, man, I was trying to get away. Look at y'all. You're all hiking too. I no, I I actually thought this was a good reminder. I I I consider myself a hiker. I like a good yep. hike, but I kind of do the same hikes over and over. Um, and I use podcasts to make the hikes different every time. But uh, yeah, it's always nice to get a good recommendation. Yeah, thank you, Chris Christensen. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. That Charlie dude wrote in a couple days ago. Echoing the sentiments of a lot of folks who are <laughs> are uh, uh, being uh, stressed by the supply chain, uh, Charlie Dude says, we've been trying to buy a stove or oven since May, and we cannot find one. We've picked three different models we would be happy with. We've even placed orders for two of them and paid for them, and we still can't get them. Delivery dates and in-stock dates keep getting pushed back. First it was August, then the delivery dates were changed to November. Now we're at January. Of the two ovens we purchased, our plan is to accept the one that arrives first and cancel the other order. Just this week, we talked with a sales manager at a local appliance store, and he said they were told that some brands of ovens wouldn't be back in stock until 2023. The reason they were given for the delay was the chip shortage. I mean... Not for nothing. It's probably partly true. I'm sure the logistics mess uh, that everything is in is also part of it. So even if you can get an oven, getting it to the store uh, is another issue. Yeah. Thank you, that Charlie dude, for for sharing the experience, though. Indeed. Yeah. And I, I Charlie, I, I I hope you get your oven. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I know you want it. I and I've totally heard the same thing from from other folks. You know, even you know, living room tables and all. You know, the supply chain, uh, not only just chip shortages, but it is uh, it is affecting a lot of folks. Well, if you have personal stories of anything that we talk about on the show, we would love to hear them. Uh, questions, comments, all of that can be sent to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to thank our brand new boss, Moses Temu, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Moses. 
go all into the applause. that holiday weekend. All of the yeah. applause is for Moses today. So uh, I don't know. It seems to be tailing off. We had that flood of new people. So if you want all the applause to be about you on Tuesday's show, you know, you got the long weekend uh, to get right. in there and become a patron. Just saying. You like Moses. All right, let's uh, talk to Len Peralta, who has been illustrating the show. Len, what have you drawn for us today? You know, I wasn't even going to touch that loot story. Uh, after hearing, I'm like, what the heck am I going to do? However, I did find the uh, um, uh, the fact-checking story and the fake book story very interesting. This is why I go and get all my, all my information from fake book world news here, of course, <laughs> which is the number one source for phony news on the Internet. Um, the main story, of course, how could you not hear this, but the Biden bat gave me COVID. It's unbelievable. That big story, the, the two-headed 5G baby attended its first day of kindergarten. Uh, did you hear about the UFOs that landed uh, and demanded Jeff Bezos' head? I did. Really? And uh, where have you been? And of course, did you, the big story, the biggest story, OJ marries Bigfoot in a secret ceremony. <sighs> Wake What's, up, sheep. You know, <laughs> it's going to happen. This is where I get all my news, and you should too. And if you want to get this cover, <laughs> this exclusive cover, this is actually at my online store at, at lenperaldestore.com. Also, uh, if you're my Patreon, patreon.com, I got Sarah laughing, patreon.com <laughs> forward slash Len. Uh, if you're a patron, you get this right away. So uh, go check it out. And uh, you know what? Keep in with the in here because of course the nft drop of the virgin mary created this massive event on the blockchain i have to we'll have to talk about it after the show because it's pretty amazing yeah yeah for sure <laughs> it was the 5g baby that got me <laughs> <laughs> it just it just it's just so first good of the kid first day of kindergarten it's amazing oh yeah the, what, how the years go by so quickly <laughs> it's amazing uh, right. nicole lee we also want to thank you for being with us today. Nicole, where can people keep up with the rest of your work? They can go to Engadget.com, where my work often appears, or they can go to my Twitter, twitter.com slash Nicole, where I will tweet my thoughts on uh, Amazon TVs and probably Shang-Chi at some point. Excellent. Well, folks, we are live Monday through Friday right here, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Join us live if you can. We're off Monday for the Labor Day holiday in the U.S., but we'll be back on Tuesday with Nate Langson. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shit, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feeds by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, ACAST, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. ACAST ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Rob Dunwood, Lamar Wilson, Patrick Norton, and Justin Robert Young. And our guest on this week's show was Nicole Lee. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>